Good afternoon and uh, welcome back. We will uh, reconvene the subcommittee. Uh, and again, I appreciate everybody's indulgence. That should be the last vote series of the day, so we can go forward, Mr. Berry, and then with our second panel. At this time, I would like to recognize the distinguished gentlewoman from Washington, D.C., Ms. Norton, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. This, uh, this hearing uh, provides the opportunity, uh, if we will use it, to clarify a number of matters. Uh, I want to thank you, Mr. Berry, because uh, just in your first uh, sentence, you have told the American people something that almost none of them know, and that is the very high quality upper uh, technology knowledge level of the workforce. Uh, I will guarantee you that, um, that there was um, almost no information when we hear what Federal employees uh, that generic term means that you are talking about judges, engineers, scientists, nuclear plant inspectors, uh, uh, as uh, less than a third of private sector workers fall into this category. The apples to bananas comparisons have grown tiresome. Um, what was particularly interesting to me uh, was uh, the extraordinary reduction in the Federal workforce uh, since the end of World War II, where you say uh, one Federal worker for every 78 residents in 53 in 2009, one for every 147. How much of this represents uh, productivity of Federal workers? How do you account for that kind of reduction per, um, per, um, uh, per capita? Congresswoman, I think uh, it, 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 certainly productivity is a big piece of that in our technology. And, and one of the reasons the workforce has gotten more sophisticated is they had to do more with less. And so they needed to have people who could handle the technology. Just managing Federal contracts, for example, uh, to ensure that there is not fraud for the taxpayers. Uh, you need highly skilled people. These are billions and billions of dollars they are accounting for and, and keeping track of. But take, uh, take Medicare, for example. Uh, Twenty percent of the Federal budget is, uh, is Medicare, and, uh, and it is administered uh, by, uh, I think that the number is sort of like .002 of the, of the Federal workforce. So it is the efficiency rate. Uh, you, you know, in terms of the productivity and being able to deliver those uh, payments accurately, uh, it, it is a combination, I would argue, of highly skilled workforce and technology and productivity improvement. Now, one of the things that both Democratic and Republican Presidents have done over the past decades is to do more and more contracting out, as, as if that were the answer to all of our woes. Uh, note that the Obama administration seems to be going in the opposite direct, direction, uh, expecting to uh, save $40 billion annually uh, by reducing the number of contracted out workers. Do these contracted out workers save us or cost us? Why have we been doing it? Uh, it is a little on both sides of the ledger. There is no, uh, I don't want it to fall into the same trap of sort of uh, a gross average answer. Uh, some cost us uh, more over time. Some cost us and have true savings. So well, do, you, do, do you know how, I mean, do you know what, you know, I tell you one thing, if there is overtime, you, you keep track of it in the Federal workforce. You keep track of the productivity of your Federal workforce. What do you do about the contracting workforce? Well, uh, we, we don't uh, track that. The Office of Management and Budget, uh, Ms. Norton, would be uh, the appropriate folks to get you uh, that data, uh, and uh, uh, the various agencies would, would track that data. But we, I unfortunately don't have that. Well, it, it's, it's very difficult for us to understand a Federal workforce that has more contracted workers than Federal employees when the focus is on Federal employees and most of the workers, including workers, that work alongside Federal employees are contracting 
employees. Now, why would a contracting employee be working alongside a Federal employee? I, I can give you a good example in my agency, and, and it goes to what the Office of Management and Budget has asked all of us to do, is to look at what are essential government functions that the government should be doing and what, uh, what could be done by the private sector. We, uh, OPM does 90 percent of the background investigations for security clearances throughout the government. We do all of the Department of Defense background investigations. We do that with about 2,000 government workers, but about Could I ask you one question before my time runs out? Sorry. Uh, the collective bargaining uh, in the Federal sector, our workers do not bargain for pay or benefits. Is that so? Uh, no, they cannot. So what do they cost us? Is there any reason why anybody would want to pull back on, on collective bargaining in the Federal sector? Uh, we, uh, the administration, are strong supporters of the partnership approach. We believe that sort of workers and managers working together can produce better service to the taxpayers, and, and we are working in that direction. Thank you very much, Mr. Berry. Thank you. Uh, now we will um, recognize the distinguished uh, chairman of the Oversight Committee, uh, gentleman from California, Mr. Issa. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you for holding this important hearing. It is very good to see you again. Yes, um, let me run through a, a couple of items. Uh, just as somebody who came out of the electronics industry yes, and allied with the auto industry, you know, we do have about a tenth as many uh, people making about eight times more cars, plus or minus some ratio. So doing twice as much over a period of 70 years I'm, or 60 plus years, I am not sure should be the standard for the Federal workforce. However, I certainly think that the Federal workforce, and I would give you this, if they fail to give us efficiencies, it is as much this side of the da dais at fault as it is uh, your side or anyone else in the administration. We are at a time, though, when we are trying to produce real savings. Mr. Chaffetz, before the break, talked to you about step increases. If you cannot support step increases today, from a standpoint of their long-term effects, can you work with us to look for a way to have step increases frozen, even if there is a, a catch-up provision later, but for the specific year's budgeting, a freeze so that the President's freeze will, in fact, be a freeze not just for those who don't have step increases, but for everybody. And we are talking only step increases here, not any of the other merit related that I know Mr. Chaffetz also was asking about. Is that something you can support if we work together on it? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think at this point in time the answer would be no. Uh, I, I, we're happy, I'm happy to go back and take that back and, and discuss that with the Office of Management and Budget to, to see if, if there would be any opening there. But I, I believe what you're talking about is within grade increases. Am I correct? Within grade. That's yes. what we're, we, we call STEP. And that's really where $500 million between now and the end of the year will occur, or between three weeks ago and the end of the year, would occur in automatic, you are simply still vertical. You could actually be disabled, but you, as long as you are still on the payroll, you are going to get these increases totaling about $500 million in this year alone, and then, of course, it continues up. My concern with that, Mr. Chairman, would be we were talking about the retention rate. And, okay. Uh, so I am going to cut you short for okay. a moment. Right. Your view is we freeze for real, we have a retention problem. Uh, it, it's, if, if you can imagine, the within grades allow a natural progression. And, uh, you know, especially for the but my, my time is short. The okay. President announced a freeze. Yes, sir. There is no freeze because with step increases, people are getting pay increases automatically. They are getting pay increases automatically this year. They will make more money. People on this side of the dais will make the same money this year they made last year and the year before because we have a freeze going on. We did not vote ourselves a pay raise. The President has announced a pay raise. The truth is, or the pay freeze. The truth is there will be pay raises through this process. And you support that from a standpoint of retention. And, and that's, that, I, a simple answer like that is fine. I am not asking you to be on our side of that particular issue or even the President's side. Let me go to a couple more that, that I think are important. The, uh, you mentioned Medicare. I would mention, as proud as I am that you do Medicare with so few people, those that Medicare has a 10 percent fraud rate. It is the worst in health care. That is by our own uh, IG, it's, and it is by the uh, stimulus uh, oversight chairman and so on, that this is, in fact, the most fraud-written program. And we are talking not about necessarily bad doctors. In some cases, we are talking about organizations that pretend to be doctors and the system doesn't catch them. 
so the last point i want to ask a specific question on is we just finished just in this in your seat a couple of days ago the gao report being presented to us shows one hundred dollars billion in savings by consolidation elimination of duplicative programs many of those are within the purview of the administration they weren't created by unique act of congress have you looked at whether or not the federal workforce can be more efficient take advantage of some of that one hundred billion dollars simply by some consolidation within the recommendations of that report, and if you haven't read the report, would you commit to re read it? Oh, absolutely. I am aware of the report, Mr. Chairman, and, and I think, in fact, I have just a summary, sort of a one-page summary of the, of the, of the highest risk items uh, that they, they mention. And, and what I would note is that three-quarters of those items have a human capital connection. And whether or not we are successful in addressing these issues are going to be uh, incumbent on us whether we have good people in the jobs to handle these issues. And so recruiting and retaining an outstanding workforce. Okay, I, I see you have circled back to the same answer, and I appreciate that. Earlier you commented that the uh, 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 AEI and Heritage reports did not include uh, an adjustment or a recognition of education experience and so on. In fact, I reviewed them, and they do. So would you look at them again uh, and commit for the record to, to give us an answer on why you think there are flaws in their process? Because this committee is at a point of going back to the GAO and doing one more study to try to find out whether or not these organizations are correct in their assessments. Because if they are correct in their assessments, clearly we are probably paying some people too little. And we are clearly paying, according to them, some people quite a bit more than would be necessary to recruit and retain. So if you would give us your comments within, let's say, two weeks, uh, that would allow us to make a decision going forward on action from uh, here. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. I be happy to do thank that. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we now recognize the distinguished gentleman from Illinois, uh, Mr. Davis, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Barrett, it is good to see you again. Yes, sir. And thank you for being here. Let me first of all commend you for some movement that I have seen in promotions, especially as it relates to women and, and other members of minority groups, and I appreciate that movement that I have observed. Let me ask you exactly what was the President doing when he initiated a freeze? What, what was he accomplishing? I think it is an important point, Congressman, that you have hit on, uh, because it goes to some of the back and forth that we have had at the hearing here today, is the Employment Cost Index reflects the cost of labor increase uh, that is determined by uh, the, what, what is happening in the private sector. Uh, the Department, uh, what we do is, is we get that data, and the law provides that Federal employees would get that minus half a percent. Um, that is not built into the budget every year. It has to be added or projected in terms of budgets. And it is an overarching number because it affects every employee of the Federal Government. All 2.1 million get that adjustment. Uh, the within grades that we were talking about here, not every employee gets that on an annual basis. Those are experience based. So you, you need to, some people get them every year, some people get them every three years. So there are some people who don't get any for a two year period. And those numbers are not additive to the budget. They are built into the agency's baseline. There are always people leaving and coming. And as senior people leave, higher salary waged folks leave, younger folks come in at lower pay. And so that balances out within the agency budget. And so the reason why I would, I would uh, have uh, argument with uh, the, the, the numbers that were being thrown around is that those are within the overall budget. And what the President has done is to direct those downward. The President has a five-year domestic spending freeze, which will take our budget to what it was when Eisenhower was in the White House. Now, that is uh, you know, a $400 billion savings. That is the way to approach reducing the Federal Government, not by across-the-board cuts, not by freezing within grades. Uh, but by dealing with the budget numbers that are real. That is what the taxpayers want. That is what the President is trying to deliver. Now, at the end of the day, you have experienced some cost savings, and you have reduced the budget, and you have accomplished something. Let me, let me go to another area. Many people that I encounter take the position or they believe 
that somehow or another the public workforce is not as efficient, not as productive, and ultimately not worth as much as private sector employees. And, and almost no matter what kind of information you give to them, they still maintain that feeling. Have you ever encountered any studies, any reports, uh, any information that would validate that kind of thinking? Uh, there, there aren't any, Mr. Sir. Uh, in fact, I, I can give you sort of two things I think address your point. The first is my own experience. Uh, I've been in Washington, D.C. since 1985 and uh, sat in the chairs where many of your staff uh, are sitting today and would regularly hear members of the Reagan administration and the Bush administration come in and, and uh, their answer under testimony was, what do you think of Federal employees? And to a person, to a person, every one of them said, I have been so impressed with the quality, the integrity, the work ethic, the dedication, and the skill that I have encountered. And in fact, many of them were listed as the biggest surprise they encountered in Washington. Now, uh, I was with Clay Johnson last Friday night. He says the exact same thing. Um, so I think anecdotally, people who are around Federal employees who see what they do come away very impressed. But the other thing, if I could just very quickly, is we survey our employees every year with questions. The most recent employee survey showed that 97 percent of respondents answered positively to the question, when needed, I am willing to put in extra effort to get the job done, whether it means staying late, whether it means working over a weekend, whatever. I will work to get it done. It matters to America. Our Federal employees are committed. They understand the criticality of their mission. They are defending us from terrorists. They are protecting our interests. And, uh, uh, I am here to, uh, to tell you I have never seen a study that would question uh, their work ethic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I believe that completes. Um, Mr. Conyers? Mr. Cummings? I'm sorry. The distinguished ranking member of the uh, Oversight Committee. Mr. Cummings, thank you. The, um, you know, one of my concerns is that, um, Mr. Berry, is that Director Berry, is that so often Federal employees are um, getting a bad rap. We all up here work with Federal employees every day, and we see what they go through. On this side of the aisle, every single one of our employees had to take a 5 percent cut. Their salaries weren't frozen took a cut in a time when milk is going up, gas is going up, rent is going up, they took a cut. And a lot of times I think we forget that public employees carry out very important functions until they are not present. And we take so much for granted. And part of the reason why we take so much for granted, Director Berry, is because they are dependable. And you said something a little bit earlier, and I want you to elaborate on this. I look at the people who work for me, work with me, rather, and I look at their education levels, and I know, without a doubt, that they could be making a whole lot more money uh, than working on this hill. I know that they could wor be working a lot less hours, some of them working to 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning, and they don't get a whole lot of money. And so, and I know that they get certain benefits, but you have gone over those benefits. And I just want you to go back, because I am tired of these public employees being beaten up on. It pains me tremendously. And so I just want you to go back, and you said something about education. And because I see, and by the way, when you talk about education, a lot of them 
are struggling trying to pay back loans because they wanted to be the best that they could be. They wanted to take advantage of opportunity. They wanted to come. And, and then after they got an education, they didn't go to Wall Street. They didn't go looking for the big bonuses. They came because they wanted to serve the public. And they have shed blood, sweat, and tears, simply trying to lift us up to make this Congress better, to make sure our airports are safe, even cleaning the airport bathrooms, cleaning these places, cafeterias. So talk about that education thing again, because I think we lose sight of that. Everywhere else, by the way, you, you get elevated because you get an education. A lot of these folks have an education and they just stay level, pretty much level funded. And now I know that over the next two years the President has said they are going to have, uh, uh, they are going to be level funded. But anyway, talk to me about that. Well, Mr. Cummings, uh, the President, as, is, as are all Americans, grateful for the, the sacrifice that Federal employees are enduring. The, the pay phrase for the two years is a real sacrifice. As you mentioned, especially those who have families who have to deal with the inflationary costs and pressures on a family, the cost of milk, the cost of gas, uh, they still have to commute and they still have to deal with those costs. And the President is clean, uh, clearly aware of their sacrifice and is grateful for it um, and recognize that they were the first ones asked to step up to the plate to help the country address the deficit. Um, and, 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 and by the way, let me just, just interject something. When I had to ask the employees, when I took over this committee, the, the Democratic side, I had to ask every single employee, I asked them, would you take a, at least a 5 percent cut? And, I, and listen to me, Director, not one of them, not one, objected. And I asked them why. You know, I said, I know you are going to have tough times. They said, because we want to serve the public. And I think we have to be very careful in these conversations that we have, uh, because we need to encourage the best and the brightest to come to government. We don't want to be caught up in a culture of mediocrity. We want the best. But anyway, I cut you off. What were you saying? Well, Mr. Cummings, and I think it goes to what you were saying also about our benefit comparisons. And, and you are going to hear a lot that somehow our benefits are out of whack with the private sector. I would argue they are very much in line, especially when you account for that we don't have profit sharing or we don't have stock options in the Federal Government. And so, most of, uh, most of my workforce is comparable with the large companies in the private sector. So it is not fair to compare Federal employees to the entire civilian labor force. I don't have retail clerks. I don't have short order cooks. I don't have waitresses. Um, God bless all of those. And I'm, they should be paid as they should be paid. But to say the Federal employees should be paid based on that is not appropriate. You need to compare like to like, apples to apples. The Fortune 500 companies are much better comparison when you are looking at who we are competing for in terms of recruitment and retention. But going to your original question, sir, you asked, the current data from uh, the current population survey shows that half of Federal workers work in the nine highest paying occupations, such as judges, engineers, scientists, nuclear plant inspectors. By comparison, only a third of the private sector, the civilian labor force, work in those nine categories. And then look at the opposite end of that spectrum. In contrast to a fifth of private sector workers in the four lowest paying occupations, the ones that have high turnover, only one in 13 of Federal employees are in that category. So when you look at these gross averages, you can see how, uh, you know, for example, that comparison there, it, it is looking at the total civilian labor force, not at like to like. And, and as you see, what you mentioned when you come into education, or comparing these things, uh, we need to reflect that the Federal workforce is a highly skilled, highly challenged workforce. Thank you very much. I see my time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Cummings. I now uh, yield to the uh, distinguished gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly, for five minutes. I thank the Chairman. And if I could pick up where Mr. Cummings was just uh, uh, leaving off. Mr. Barry, if I understand your testimony, what you are saying is that um, uh, the skill set mix of the public sector, the Federal workforce is quite different than the private sector uh, skill set of the workforce at large in the country. Of the total civilian labor force, absolutely, Mr. Connolly. That's, that's my core point. And, and we really need to compare. Uh, we are running, if you will, a company of 2 million employees that is dealing with challenges 
that, uh, that rival anything. Uh, it really doesn't have a comparison in the private sector because it, it's bigger than the Fortune 500, if you will. But to compare it to the total civilian labor force, uh, I can see why politically that might be a, a popular thing to do if, if you had a certain ideological perspective. But it unfairly uh, compares wages, and, and, and it is not an apple-to-apple -apple comparison. Um, with respect to the size of the Federal workforce, um, is the current Federal workforce significantly larger than it was when President George H. W. Bush was in the White House in 1991? Mr. Connolly and Mr. Ross, I can leave this or give this to you for the record. This is from GAO, so I, I did not make up these numbers. Uh, but it shows you the civilian labor force from 1950 to the present. And it is this red line, and as you can see, it is pretty flat. Federal expenditures are the blue line, Federal outlays. So outlays have gone up absolutely over that time period, but the workforce has remained largely stable. And so in these are GAO numbers. In absolute numbers? Uh, yes. Yes, sir. So, so despite the sign behind Mr. Lynch's head, which I am sure the ranking member would prefer not be put there. <laughs> um, and I hope our Republican friends remember this when we are back in the majority. <laughs> there will be all kinds of signs. You may not like them. Uh, or we could be civil to one another and actually respect the fact that the ranking member sits there and there shouldn't be a sign behind his head that he doesn't want. But that would be a different issue. Um, where were we, Mr. Berry? Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, so uh, despite the hysterics, actually the workforce hasn't grown that much, but the missions have. Is that correct, Mr. Berry? There is no question. Can you think of some missions uh, <laughs> that have expanded since 1991, even though the workforce has not? Absolutely. And in fact, the, the majority of that increase is in what we would either be in defense. Mr. Berry, I am going to ask you not to point to a sign we are going to pretend does not exist. <laughs> All right. Go ahead would be in either homeland security dealing with the very issue you are talking about since 9-11. We have obviously had to stand up a significant counterterrorism force in the country. Uh, both parties are in agreement that that is something we need to do. We need to protect our borders well. Both parties agree to that. So we need to be careful, and we need to protect our vets when they come home with serious injuries. And we need more nurses and doctors to care for them. So let me understand. Uh, for example, since President H. W. Bush, George H. W. Bush was in the White House in 1991, and the workforce he had, which is roughly the workforce we have, we created a whole new agency of Federal Government, Homeland Security. Is that correct? Yes, sir. In response to the terrorist attacks in 9-11. Is that correct? Yes, sir. We beefed up FEMA after its utter collapse and fecklessness in responding to Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans and the Gulf Coast. Is that correct? Uh, I would have to check my budget numbers to answer that one, sir. Mm. I think the answer is yes. Um, <laughs> if you uh, and of course, we're, since President H, uh, George H. W. Bush was in the White House, we are fighting two wars right now: Iraq and Afghanistan. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And all of the attendant costs associated with that, including, as you say, caring for the wounded veteran when he or she returns home, and increasing the the handoff in Iraq. There is a stand up and increase, as as Mr. Lynch knows, who has been there many times. Uh, there's, uh, and as the military mission is drawing down, the State Department employees are drawing up. So there is an increase of people going into a very highly dangerous area, serving their country and putting their lives at risk. Uh, that is a civilian increase. And so we need to recognize that. And that number is folded into this number as well. Good, good point, And I am going to end on that. So in other words, there are civilian Federal employees putting their lives at risk next to uniformed military in both Iraq and Afghanistan. Is that correct, Mr. Berry? Absolutely. And Mr. Mr. Lynch has invited me, and I look forward to being able to attend uh, with him to uh, one of his visits to Iraq or Afghanistan, where we can honor the service of both our military and our civilian workforce uh, that both put their lives at great danger Thank to you. serve our country. Thank you. I see my time is up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Connolly. Uh, that being the uh, last of our uh, uh, question, uh, questioners, we will uh, recess now. Thank you, Mr. Berry, very much for being here. And we will uh, take a few minutes to have our clerks prepare for the, uh, the next panel. Thank you, sir. It is an honor. Thank you.
Welcome to our second panel. We'll now be uh, getting the second part of our, our hearing today. Um, and today we have with us Mr. James Shirk, who is a senior policy analyst in labor economics at the Heritage Foundation. Uh, we also have Dr. Andrew Biggs, a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, Mr. Max Steyer is the president and CEO of the Partnership for Public Service. And Ms. Colleen Kelly is the national president of the National Treasury Employees Union. Uh, if you all would mind, wouldn't mind, please stand uh, to be sworn in pursuant to uh, committee rules. All witnesses must be sworn in. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Let the record reflect that all witnesses answered in the affirmative. Please be seated. I will now um, uh, recognize each of you to, to, for five minutes to summarize uh, your testimony with the transcript, of course, has been submitted for the record. And, uh, Mr. Shirk, we will start off with you. You have five minutes. Thank you. Chairman Ross, Ranking Member Lynch, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to testify. My name is James Shirk, and I am a senior policy analyst at the Heritage Foundation. The views I express in this testimony are my own and should not be construed as representing an official position of the Heritage Foundation. I want to explain to you this afternoon that the Federal pay system is broken. As a consequence of its failings, the average Federal employee earns significantly more than they would in the private sector. There are three features of the Federal pay system that Congress should be aware of. The first feature is that it does a poor job of approximating market pay. The general schedule places heavy emphasis on internal equity so that jobs of a similar level of work receive the same pay. An engineer, an IT specialist, and a budget analyst at the same GS grade all receive the same pay. The law requires the President's pay agent to set Federal pay by determining what level of work a private sector job entails and what general schedule grade that would translate into. The pay agent then sets the Federal pay by averaging pay across the different jobs it is determined uh, belongs in each grade. This effectively superimposes the general schedule system onto private sector payrolls. However, private sector employers do not base pay on anything remotely resembling the general schedule. Market forces such as relative supply and demand for different skills, specialties, and occupations uh, determine private pay. Employees in different occupations performing similar, quote, levels of work often earn very different salaries. As a result, Federal pay often looks nothing like market rates in both directions. Some Federal employees earn wildly inflated salaries, 40 to 50 percent above what they would earn in the private sector. Other Federal employees do not receive a cash wage premium at all and may receive slightly below market rates. Typically, highly skilled workers such as scientists and lawyers do not receive premium wages in the government. The second feature of the Federal pay system that Congress should understand is that, on average, it overpays Federal employees. My research, using data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, shows that after you account for education, experience, and occupations so that you can make an apples-to-apples -apples comparison, once you do that, the average Federal employee makes 22 percent more an hour than they would if they were in the private sector. Including the value of their benefits raises the Federal compensation premium to between 30 and 40 percent. The average Federal employee earns more than they would if they were in the private sector, and paying this premium will cost taxpayers almost $50 billion this year. Many other economists with views that span the political spectrum have come to this view. Dr. Alan Kruger served as the chief economist in the, at the Treasury Department in the Obama administration. He found that, and I am quoting him, the Federal Government appears to consistently pay higher wages in the private sector for comparable employees. Economists do not debate whether the Federal Government overpays its employees. The research consistently shows that they are. It is important to emphasize, however, that this average Federal premium is only part of the total variation between Federal and market pay. It is simultaneously true that many Federal employees are not overpaid and that the Federal Government pays private sector employees more on average. The only major study to disagree with this conclusion is the President's pay agent report, which uses the flawed methodology I described. No administration has ever found the results of the pay agent report credible or acted on them. The pay agent itself frequently expresses concerns with the methodology the law requires it to use. This is for good reason. If Federal employees were underpaid, then the Federal Government would have severe retention problems. Just the opposite occurs. Federal employees quit their jobs just one-third as often as private sector workers. This happens because they know they are getting a better deal in the, private, in the Federal Government than they could get in the private sector. 
The third feature of the Federal pay system that Congress should understand is that it rewards time served, not performance. Woody Allen once observed that 90 percent of life is just showing up. For Federal employees, 75 percent of life is just showing up. Less than one quarter of the money spent on Federal pay increases is meaningfully tied to performance. The rest is either automatic or essentially automatic. Employees on the general schedule start at the first step of their assigned job grade. As long as they receive a 3 out of 5 performance rating, they automatically receive step increases until they advance to step 10. Managers who wish to give ratings below 3, however, bear the burden of proving that the employee performs poorly. The system assumes that Federal employees are adequate and gives them raises. Consequently, Federal managers rarely use performance ratings below 3, and, like I said, most Federal employees receive step increases. It is social promotion for adults. Unsurprisingly, then, with this system, Federal employees receive raises and promotions more rapidly than private sector workers do. My research shows that this is one of the major reasons Federal employees receive above market pay. Thank you, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about the Federal pay system and how its flaws inflate Federal compensation. Thank you, Mr. Shirk. Mr. Dr. Biggs, you are recognized for five minutes. Chairman Ross, Ranking Member Lynch, and members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me to testify with regard to Federal employment compensation. My testimony today is based upon joint research with Jason Richwine of the Heritage Foundation, and a copy of our working paper has been closed with my testimony. We limit our analysis to one question. Do Federal employees on average receive greater compensation than these individuals could receive in the private sector? Our answer, which is consistent with several decades of economic research, is yes. To begin, you are doubtless aware of the President's pay agent, which reports that Federal jobs pay over 20 percent less than comparable private sector positions. You should also be aware of why most economists are skeptical of the pay agent approach. The most important reason is simply that the pay agent's approach compares apples and oranges. While the pay agent claims to compare similar Federal and private sector jobs, it does not compare similar workers. That is, it does not account for the fact that the Federal Government hires workers at higher pay grades and promotes them faster than does the private sector. For instance, a person working as a senior accountant in the Federal Government might have the experience and education of only a junior accountant in the private sector. A 1984 Congressional Budget Office study concluded that the average Federal worker resides two-thirds of a pay grade above a similar private sector employee. A 1997 academic study found a larger gap of three-quarters of a pay grade. A 2002 study using BLS occupational data showed, quote, that Federal workers have significantly fewer years of education and experience than private sector workers in the same level of responsibility in an occupation. Once this study accounted for differences in experience and education, the supposed pay penalty disappeared. So how do economists study public-private pay differences? Labor economists begin by controlling for how individual workers differ with regard to earnings-related factors such as experience, education, geographic location, and so forth. Let me reiterate here that, that despite what we heard throughout Director Berry's uh, testimony and in some of the questions, the study I have conducted and that Mr. Shirk has conducted do control for differences in education between Federal employees and private sector employees. They do control for that. By controlling for these differences, you can isolate the effects on pay of working in the Federal or the private sector. Using census data from 2006 through 2010, we found that Federal employees receive average salaries 14 percent higher than similar workers employed by large private sector firms. This is actually a conservative comparison since large firms offer the best salaries and benefits. If we compare to all private sector workers, the Federal salary premium rises to 22 percent. Some argue, however, that this method ignores relevant differences between workers. For instance, our educational data tells us only if you have a certain degree, not your GPA or the quality of the school you attended. As an alternative, we followed individual workers' salaries over time, tracking how their pay changed as they moved into or out of the government. Workers who switch between the Federal and private sectors earn about 8 percent more when employed by the Federal Government, and this is just the initial premium upon switching. Whether we exam diff examine different workers at the same point in time or follow the same workers over time, it is clear that most Federal employees would earn lower salaries in the private sector. 
Benefits are an important component of overall compensation, but comprehensive data on Federal benefits must be assembled by hand. Using OMB and OPM data, we calculated the value of a wide range of Federal benefits, from pensions and health coverage to vacation time and employee <laughs> awards. On average, Federal employees receive total benefits equal to around 66 percent of their salaries. In large private sector firms, benefits average 50 percent of salaries. In other words, Federal workers receive a benefit premium of around 33 percent over similar private sector employees. Combined Federal salaries and benefits are roughly 25 percent above what similar private sector employees would receive. Economists since Adam Smith have noted that positions with greater job security should pay lower salaries, just as safe investments like bonds pay lower returns than stocks. The BLS reports that in any given year, Federal workers are less than one-third as likely as private sector employees to be fired or laid off. We estimate the value of job security using the tools of financial economics to calculate the pay reduction a private sector worker would willingly accept to have the increased job security of Federal employees. Using conservative assumptions, we find that Federal workers' job security is equivalent to an extra 11 percent of pay. When salaries, benefits, and job security are properly valued, the total Federal compensation package is worth upwards of 39 percent more than is paid to similar private sector workers. The total Federal pay premium could top $60 billion per year. Identifying the pay premium is far easier than fixing it. Simple pay freezes or furloughs are blunt instruments that will not get to the heart of the issue. Federal pay must be made to reflect market conditions, not with a one-time adjustment, but with fundamental reforms that work consistently into the future. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Biggs. Uh, Mr. Steer, you are recognized for five minutes. Great. Thank you very much, Chairman Ross, Ranking Member Lynch, and the members of the subcommittee. It is a pleasure being here, uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to testify. I respectfully suggest that we are asking the wrong question here. It is not whether Federal workers are underpaid or overpaid. Uh, but rather, what, how do we move a system to a more market-sensitive system? Uh, John O'Leary at Harvard said it is the Goldilocks truth. In any group of public servants, you are going to find some that are underpaid, some that are overpaid, and some that are paid just right. Our challenge is to make sure that our government has the best talent for the best price. Uh, I would propose, then, we have seven core principles that you look at in thinking about where we go from here. First, number one, obviously, we need a pay system based on the market for needed talent. Uh, we need to make sure that, again, we have competitive salaries set not just by geography but also by occupation and the relevant factors that have been discussed already. Second, we need to account for benefits cautiously. So, yes, benefits do matter, um, but I don't think you can look, for example, at job security and see that as an across the board benefit. If you are trying to hire the very critical cybersecurity talent coming out of school today, the fact that a job may have more security isn't going to be really relevant for them. In fact, that may be a turnoff. You got to understand your talent, you got to understand what's going to appeal to them, and you got to be specific to the job, to the talent that you actually need. Third, we need to get better data. Right now, we're looking at, uh, again, cross the board comparisons if you look by geography, uh, but we're not looking at the very concrete, specific surveys that most companies do when they're trying to analyze what they ought to be paying for the, the talent that they need. And in government, we need to do a lot better in order to get that information. Fourth, we also need to look at the quality of the hires we're looking at. This is actually a balance here. You think about what you are paying, but you have to think what you are paying for. And right now in government, we don't do a very good job of understanding what quality talent is and how to retain it. And unless we have those quality measurements, then in fact we are not going to be, ever be able to design the right system, because we are not going to know whether we are getting the right value for the money that is being spent. Uh, so we need to make sure that agencies are recruiting uh, the right talent uh, and we know what that right talent looks like. Uh, number five, we need to make sure we reform the Federal classification system. Uh, the pay system, the classification system are intertwined. The classification system wasn't designed for the world that we live in today, and we need to make sure that that is aligned with today's job market. An example, uh, a GS-11 is someone who performs work, quote, of marked difficulty and responsibility, while a GS-12 is someone who performs work of, quote, a very high order of difficulty and responsibility. It doesn't make any sense. If you are a GS-12 engineer, HR professional, budget analyst, whatever it may be, you get paid the same. A lot of internal equity, but what that means is that you are really not actually matching the market for talent. Uh, number six, we need to make sure we have good workforce planning. We need to make sure that we actually know what talent we need. Today, we don't actually have a government-wide uh, plan on the human capital that we need to make sure the government runs right, and we need that. In fact, we don't really know, we can't, we're not forecasting uh, enterprise-wide the sorts of skills that we need to be able to succeed in the world we are going into. And that is a, a component piece of what we ought to be looking at here. Uh, and then number seven, we need real flexibility. If you look at the, the, the uh, uh, um, 
the, the government today, you in fact have a lot of agencies that have already been given different uh, authority to create different systems. For example, the VA, they were finding that they couldn't actually recruit the doctors and nurses that they need, so they were given authority. The financial regulatory institutions, you have a diverse set of agencies all trying to do different things. We need to make sure that whatever is done with this system, that it permits for the flexibility to allow for the different needs of these organizations to recruit the talent that they need. So what about going forward here? I propose that there are four key recommendations. Number one, this has to be a collective effort. Uh, we need the best minds. We need to make sure everyone is at the table. That includes employee groups. It includes, obviously, the best minds that know about compensation uh, that can help design the right thing. Secondly, we need to design from where we are today. This is not a blank paper exercise. We have to design something that takes us from where we are today to where we need to go. And that may mean there are populations, for example, that may be viewed as being overpaid. Well, how do you make sure that they are treated fairly in a process of moving them to that new system? That is an extra challenge. Uh, number three, we need to build off of what's worked. We have had experiments in, in government before. We have had a demonstration project authority for 30 years. There are organizations that have tried different things. I mentioned earlier the agencies that have already given, been given different authority, whether it is the financial uh, organizations or uh, you know, many, many others, uh, GAO being another example. And we have got to be looking at um, and what's worked with them. And then finally, we need to take a step back and understand what success looks like. We need accountability on our end to make sure that we are actually driving towards the right outcomes. And again, that ought to be getting the right talent at the most cost-effective fashion. So Steve Covey said it best. He said the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And that ought to be, you know, again, outcomes for the American people, which requires the best talent at the most cost-effective uh, mechanism and price. So we have got to avoid the distractions, I believe, of thinking underpaid, overpaid, and focus on that key issue. Appreciate the opportunity to be before you and hope I uh, can answer some questions later. Thank you, Mr. Steer. Uh, Ms. Kelly, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairman Ross, Ranking Member Lynch, and members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to testify today. The pay system for the large majority of white-collar Federal employees is known as the general schedule. Its main thesis is that Federal pay should be comparable to pay for similar work in the private sector. In 1990, Congress enacted the Federal Employees Pay Comparability Act, FEPCA, which introduced the concept of locality adjustments to make the pay system even more sensitive to geographic market forces. FEPCA requires the Bureau of Labor Statistics to conduct surveys of the 32 separate localities and then provide that information to the President's pay agent, which, as we have heard today, consists of the Secretary of Labor, the Director of OMB, and the Director of OPM, who then have the statutory responsibility of submitting a report to the President each year that lists pay gaps in the 32 areas as well as a national average gap. The pay agent reports showing lower pay for Federal employees have been consistent in Democratic as well as Republican administrations. The reasons that the data from BLS and the Heritage Foundation differ are many. Most importantly, BLS compares actual job duties, not just job titles, but job duties. And, as we have heard, more than 54 percent of Federal workers work in the nine highest paying occupation groups. Federal employees are more experienced, they are older, and they have many more years of education, as we have already heard, than private sector workers. With regard to benefits, Federal employees, as well as members of Congress, are covered by the Federal Employees Health Benefit Program. Enrollees pay, on average, 30 percent of the total premium cost. According to Mr. Shirk, in the private sector, workers pay 18 percent of their premiums for single plans and 29 percent for family plans. In the 1980s, the Federal Employees Retirement System was created to replace a defined benefit system. There has been discussion about that today also. The earlier plan had serious and growing unfunded liability problems uh, that are similar to those faced by many States today. But the first system today is fully funded and it is financially sound with no unfunded liability. And Federal retirement pensions are not overly generous. Close to 70 percent of Federal retirees receive annuities of less than $3,000 a month. Mr. Chairman, in a recent interview, you were quoted as indicating your support for instituting so-called pay for performance in the Federal Government. And I am a big believer in setting goals, meaningful goals, and then figuring out how to reach those goals. With regard to pay for performance, I believe that uh, past conversations have proven that uh, the goals are very often glossed over with statements like, we want flexibility, or it needs to be more modern. Uh, it seems to me that a pay system should have a couple of major uh, goals attached to it. Number one, does it help to recruit and retain the best people for the jobs? 
And number two, does it help to motivate employees to better achieve the agency mission? I don't know of a single so-called pay-for-performance system that is showing progress in either of these goals today in the Federal Government. I discussed the serious problems uh, with several of these systems in my written statement, including those at the TSA and the repealed NSPS system at the Department of Defense. And the Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration has gone so far as to say of the IRS manager's pay banding system that the IRS risks reducing its ability to provide quality service to taxpayers because the Internal Revenue Pay for Performance system potentially hinders the IRS's ability to recruit, retain, and motivate highly skilled leaders. The Government Accountability Office has found that the flexibilities that are most effective in managing the Federal workforce include things like time off awards and flexible work schedules that allow employees to better balance the demands of career and family life. These and other existing flexibilities need to be used more widely. Suggestions have also been made that contracting out more Federal work will lead to more cost efficiency. We have had recent experience with this notion and it has not proven true. According to OMB, excessive reliance on contractors has eroded the in-house capacity of agencies to perform many critical functions, and it has undermined their ability to accomplish their missions. The Obama administration has begun to reform this out-of-control contracting by requiring agencies to cut wasteful contracting practices and to improve oversight and accountability. These efforts are expected to result in $40 billion in annual savings beginning in 2011. Mr. Chairman, some of the hardest working people I represent make less than $30,000 a year, yet they are facing a two-year pay freeze and retirees are in the second year without a cost of living increase. NTEU members understand that the country faces challenges, and although they did not cause the fiscal crisis, they are willing to work to help solve it. Thank you for the opportunity to testify here today, and I would be glad to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Kelly, and I will uh, yield myself five minutes. Interesting, in reading each transcript uh, and in listening to uh, both sides of the, the dais here, is that I think we all believe that we need to recruit and retain and reward good employees in Federal employment. And, and, and I, I think that is some good common ground to begin with. But I also note that in the last uh, panel there was testimony given about how the Federal workforce has remained almost stable in terms of numbers since President George H. W. Bush until today. But yet there seems to be a correlation also that inversely we have seen an increase in debt significantly since George H. W. Bush, well over 60 percent. And, Mr. Shirk, my question to you is, is if you were a businessman and you had a workforce, and yet you maintained your same workforce, but you have dec increased your debt by 60 percent, would that be indicative of something that needed to be done with your personnel management? I think it would be a sign that you have got some uh, pretty serious problems. Um, you mentioned also, uh, you talked briefly about uh, uh, Federal um, um, in benefits, benefits for Federal employees. Um, what impact does it have on total, total compensation, the, the, the value of Federal employee benefits? Uh, it increases it fairly substantially. If you take a look at only the, the wage premium, only you know, the cash pay that shows up in uh, your pay stub, Federal employees, again, on average, uh, when you are making that apples to apples comparison, are making 22 percent more an hour. But if you then add in the value of those uh, uh, benefits, uh, like the, uh, the pension benefits, uh, both the defined benefit and the defined contribution pension they receive, and uh, add in uh, the, the value of those remaining benefits, that compensation premium increases to between 30 and 40 percent. So it's, uh, they get generous pay and even more generous benefits. Uh, Dr. Biggs, you have discussed that, that lowering wages uh, would only slightly reduce the quality of the Federal job applicants. Could you discuss any of your work that led to that conclusion? Well, in our working paper, we actually cited some uh, research by Professor Stephen Venti of, of Dartmouth College in New Hampshire. And the research he looked at is what are called cues for government jobs. The research tries to look at is there more demand for government jobs than, than private sector jobs? Are there people waiting out there who would like to get government jobs who cannot? Uh, what uh, Mr. Professor Venti found was that, that three to six times as many people would be willing to accept Federal employment as are actually offered jobs, implying that Federal jobs offer significant 
significantly more attractive overall compensation package than, than private sector employees. Because you have such a large queue for Federal jobs, Venti found that you could cut salaries significantly without hurting the quality of applicants. Uh, Venti found that even a 16 percent reduction in salaries would only slightly reduce the educational qualifications of Federal job applicants. Uh, I would add that Pro Professor Kruger of Princeton uh, took an even simpler approach. Uh, he measured the number of qualified applica applicants that Federal job openings received relative to private sector job openings. He found that Federal jobs on average Average received 25 to 30 percent more applicants than private sector positions. Again, this is, uh, this is another indication of demand for Federal jobs, which means that if the salary were reduced, you would not see a large reduction in the quality of applicants for Federal positions. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Steer, I want to go to you real quickly, because the, the general schedule, which has been around since 1949, doesn't take into consideration any market forces, does it? Uh, it doesn't. It takes it now. The locality. For locality, correct. But and, not and by that's occupation. It. That's correct. But in terms of incentivizing somebody to do well, uh, as opposed to somebody just to show up and get a paycheck, it really doesn't make that distinction, does it? Uh, from a recruiting perspective, it's not market sensitive. On the performance side, there are opportunities to give performance bonuses to people to have increased step increases. So there are performance mechanisms that are currently in the system. Uh, and and you have talked about, and, and yes. just to be quick here, you have talked right. about performance, uh, pay for performance programs. Yes. And I would yes. like to know quickly, do you feel that there is an adequate pay for performance, performance system out there that would adequately compensate those in the Federal workforce based on outcomes? Look, I think that the data is clear, which is employees don't believe that they are rewarding, they are currently being rewarded for doing better work. So I think the answer is no. The system is not working in the way it ought to, otherwise employees would be saying something different. But do you think there could be one so implemented, a pay for performance? I think that there could be, but I think the work that needs to be done first is to get a handle on how to make sure we know what good performance is and to be able to reward it uh, accordingly. Okay. Ms. Kelly, what I would like to do is I want to just have you step aside from your, your role uh, with the, uh, the, the, the Treasury's Union right now and assume, if you will, that you were in charge of making decisions of, an, of a corporation that was showing a significant decline in uh, revenues, so much so that their debt has increased by 60 percent over a 10-year period of time, and, and you have to make a decision about personnel. Would you rather pursue a decision about personnel that you would have to let people go or have to reduce their salaries? Well, the first thing I want to know is what caused the decline in revenue and what caused the debt. And but but uh, assume that workforce. it is. I mean, it's, it is what it is. So now you have to well, make a decision. If the workforce didn't cause it, then I need to get to the root cause of what it is. And uh, in this case, I think there are uh, a lot of other things to look at. Like, so you can't uh, say one way or the other what you would do? Well, as I said, the workforce didn't cause the debt. If they didn't cause the debt, then I think that working with them and figuring out what can be done, and my bet is they are going to have some suggestions of how to change and do the work better and to not do things, for example, like cut taxes on the wealthiest Americans that would, are probably, uh, is probably impacting the revenue that is coming in. Thank you. I see my time is up. I will now yield to the uh, distinguished gentleman from Massachusetts and the ranking member, Mr. Lynch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, President Kelly, you can put your union hat back on. <laughs> Uh, look, uh, 60 percent of, of, uh, of the Federal employees work in, in three, basically three departments, uh, one being DOD, and uh, we have already had a number of members talk about the fact that we are in two wars. Uh, my wife says I spend way too much time in Iraq and Afghanistan. She is probably right. Uh, the rest of the uh, employees in that large group work at the VA and they work at, uh, at DHS. And I know from my own experience, uh, when we look at what is going on at Iraq and, in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, I know we have about 10 million, 10 million private contractors across our government. It is sort of a shadow government. And more and more of responsibilities are being contracted out. And I don't see any reduction in, in costs. Uh, you know, we had a dilemma uh, early on in Afghanistan where we were trying to decide whether embassy personnel, congressional codels uh, should be uh, guarded by Blackwater, who, who do, look, I have been under the care and protection of Blackwater. They do an amazing job. But let us just look at the costs here for a minute, though. Uh, right now, Blackwater charges us, or XC, or 
a triple canopy, they charge us about $1,500 a day, $1,500 a day for one security officer, uh, whereas uh, if I have a U.S. Uh, uh, Marine or, or uh, Army uh, soldier do it, uh, we are talking about $54,000 a year for the average soldier. So $54,000 a year versus $450,000 a year. And, uh, you know, I, I, I see in my own district, uh, in, you know, that goes the same for USAID. USAID does wonderful work in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, but when that goes over to the contractor side, the, the price goes right through the roof. And so I, it just troubles me greatly that people are saying, well, we will privatize this stuff and we will save money. That has not been my experience. As well in my own district, you know, I spend a lot of time at the VA. And uh, the VA, I got a VA hospital in Brockton, one in West Roxbury, one in Jamaica Plain. And quite frankly, uh, the nurses there, I, the biggest problem I have is when nurses and therapists being stolen away by the private hospitals in the area. And uh, quite frankly, the, the one thing that keeps my VA nurses and docs and staff uh, and, and uh, therapists in place at the VA is that they are so proud to serve veterans. It is their commitment to veterans. They love their job because they are caring for the United States uh, uniform veterans. That is what is keeping them there. They are working at lower rates, and the you know, private sector hospitals are stealing them away. That is one of my biggest problems, to, to encourage you know, young nurses to go work at the VA. And uh, you know, I just see a, a lot of this uh, you know, uh, acrimony and, and uh, attacks on Federal employees are just not borne out under the facts. Now, Mr. Steer, you do raise a good point about how we can do this better going forward. But, uh, uh, President Kelly, I want to ask you, in terms of the folks that, that you are seeing at NTEU, uh, you know, we are asking you to oversee, uh, you know, in many cases we are asking you, uh, your folks to oversee tremendous responsibility. They could make a ton of money in the private sector. Uh, you mentioned in your testimony there are some gaps and differences in what you see these studies providing and what you see uh, actually in, in practice at, at Treasury. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that? Well, the, if you look at, um, if you ever were a Federal employee and if you know the work that they do, it is um, it's not work that you can just measure on a piece of paper. I was an IRS revenue agent for almost 15 years. And as an accountant and a CPA, um, I know the kinds of uh, Wall Street representatives that the IRS agents have to go up against and be knowledgeable um, on in order to find the uh, you know, financial schemes and scams that are happening. Uh, I mean, th that is the kind of talent and uh, uh, skill that you need, and you have to be willing to pay for it. And I also think that in this economy, you know, there has been a lot of talk about how many applications and you know, um, how willing people are to come work for the government. In this economy, it is one world. I think uh, when the economy turns, and it is obviously taking longer than we all hope, but when it does, I am very worried about the talent that the Federal Government has been able to recruit and whether or not they are going to be able to keep them. When you look at the uh, compensation and the gaps that um, are very well known by the employees, they make a conscious decision, as you said. They make a conscious decision every day. Many of them want to work. They have a desire to serve. They have a desire to work for our country. Um, and they are willing to give up some of the extras. Uh, but in the long run, and on most days, they want to be treated fairly, and that is really what this conversation is about. Thank you very much. I see my time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Lynch. I now recognize the um, ranking member of the uh, Committee on Oversight, uh, the distinguished gentleman from Maryland. Or, um, on second thought, I am going to recognize the distinguished gentlewoman from Washington, D.C., Ms. Norton. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, um, Ms. Kelly, um, you and I have sat in this very room when it was less rehabilitated, um, I must say, in any number of hearings, uh, including joint hearings uh, from Senate and House uh, committees concerned about the uh, state of the Federal workforce, particularly 
the retiring of the so-called baby boomers. Um, uh, you testify that 90 percent of the SES, senior, uh, the senior service, could retire uh, within the next 10 years. This, of course, is considered by everybody to be uh, the, the creme de la creme of, of the workforce of the United States, these people who were, who were apparently drawn for a number of reasons, the post-Kennedy uh, folks. There has been a lot of discussion here uh, about Federal employees, but little discussion about a return on investment that any employer will understand. The, when you hire an employee, let's take people in this, in this very uh, uh, room, if you see one of your employees in whom you have invested time and energy walk out the door, you are seeing your investment in that employee walk out of the door as well. Uh, and so uh, the investment, uh, the return on your investment becomes important if that is a high-quality uh, uh, employee. Uh, um, the, the others on the panel have apparently agreed that there was, there is a greater return on experience in the Federal workforce, and that may account for uh, some of the promotions. I, we know this, rapidly turnover, rapid turnover takes investment, of course, uh, out of the door. I wish you would describe, um, uh, the, uh, and of course the notion from, of promotion from within encourages people to stay, and you want to encourage it, competition. If you want people to compete for these employees, you at least want to keep your investment in the Federal sector. So you would like the investment to occur among Federal agencies rather than have the private sector benefit from the investment of the taxpayers in the Federal employee. I wish you would describe that in places like the IRS uh, and the other agencies uh, you uh, re represent. There are many employees who begin their work for the Federal Government in an entry-level position in, uh, in whatever their agency is. And they, what they hope is that they will see opportunities to move into new positions, to be promoted, to learn, to enhance their skills, to receive training, and to move up within the agency so they can do more complex and more important work for the agency. In agencies where those promotion opportunities do not exist, you will tend to see people leave more because obviously people want you know, to know that they have some opportunity in the future. But I also have to believe that happens in the private sector. Um, you know, most people do not go into a job and want to stay in that specific job, in that occupation um, for their entire career. They are looking for opportunities to grow. And in the Federal Government, the idea that there are so many different jobs and so much important work across agencies gives employees the opportunity to do just that, and they take it. Yeah, and, and of course the Federal Government has made a decision. It wants career employees. It is a career service. It is a civil service. Um, I wish you would describe, there have been some inflammatory statements made by others on the panel about uh, collective bargaining uh, in Wisconsin and the rest. Um, there seems to be very little understanding of the uh, role that unions can play when there needs to be reductions in the workforce, when there need to be uh, givebacks of some kind in the workforce, as opposed to when you have to do that and nobody is there to make the employers understand how it occurred. The President has had a um, management uh, workers' council. I wonder if you describe how that works. Well, the, um, about a year ago, uh, labor management forms were created under an executive order that the President signed. And that executive order uh, has as its um, underpinning that the idea of collaboration and that working together we can figure out some of the most difficult problems that we face. And that has included situations, as you describe, uh, Congresswoman Norton, where um, the workforce has to change because the work of the agency changes and either work goes away um, and therefore there needs to be a smaller workforce. And it is uh, the unions working side by side with management to deal with these very, very difficult issues to try to do two things. One, ensure that the agency is able to continue to be successful in whatever its mission is, but at the same time to do all they can to um, have employees have opportunities to be placed somewhere else uh, to make sure that those skills, those experiences are not lost. But uh, when there have had to be those kinds of situations, 
The only way that it happens in a way that is successful for the agency and for the workforce, in my view, is if the unions are working with management and if management has the unions uh, in every conversation so that it is something that we can craft the best solution to. That is how you get labor peace. Thank you very much, Ms. Kelly. Thank you, Ms. Norton. I uh, now recognize the distinguished gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Shirk, let me ask you, are you a fan of pay for performance? I think it is a good idea. It needs to be done correctly, but uh, in, in the general principle, yes. Do you think it can be broadly used or could be broadly used in the, say, the Federal Government? Uh, broadly speaking, yes. Okay. And we would expect better results than what we get in terms of productivity as well as how we compensate uh, our employees? If it is designed correctly, you should. Um, Dr. Biggs, let me ask you, um, you were here when, when Mr. Berry was testifying, and you heard him talk about uh, comparing apples with apples and oranges with oranges. and. Um, to arrive at the conclusion that you made relative to the comparability of, of, of public versus private sector pay, uh, is that the methodology that you used? I will pick my words carefully here and say that uh, Director Berry did not correctly describe the methodology that I have used. In, uh, in this study or that others, like Mr. Shirk or academics, have used. Uh, the claim he made was that Federal employees are better educated on average than private sector employees, and that is a, that's a, a correct claim. Uh, he also claimed, though, that the, the pay studies that I have done and that others have done do not correctly account for that, that we are comparing apples and oranges. In fact, that is totally untrue. The, the studies that we have done control for differences between the education and other characteristics of the Federal workforce and the private sector workforce. In other words, we compare apples to apples. We control for these differences. The Federal pay agents analysis, which finds a pay penalty of 20 to almost 25 percent, by contrast, that doesn't take education into, into account. It looks at a job but does not account for the fact that uh, private sector employers tend to put more educated, more experienced individuals into those jobs than public sector employers do. And we know that the value coming out of a job is a combination of the job and the inputs of the individual himself. So I would say he miscorrectly characterized the study that I did. Well, let me ask you, uh, based upon your description, would a clerk at uh, Walmart be the same as a clerk in one of our agencies um, if you were looking at the two? In general, no. In general, we, we don't uh, categorize people by job types. We categorize them by, by what is called the human capital they are bringing to the game. A, a clerk in the Federal Government would generally have um, at least a high school education, a bachelor's degree, and so we're, we're, we're counting the educational experience, the, the, the other experiences they may have, which will partly account for them getting better pay. I'm not, uh, and our study doesn't say Federal employees shouldn't be higher paid on average than private sector employees. The question is how much higher should they be paid? By controlling for differences in education, experience, and other factors, we can find the effect of working uh, in the Federal Government or outside in the private sector. And what we find and what other studies consistently have found in peer-reviewed research over the past three decades is that if you take the same individual and put them in the Federal Government versus the private sector, that individual will get a significant salary premium in the Federal Government. That is not just what we are saying. That is what the peer-reviewed research consistently says. Mr. Steer, let me ask you. You began your testimony by suggesting that maybe we were asking the wrong questions or exploring the wrong possibilities and options, and that what we really ought to be looking at is how do we get the best workforce that we possibly can for the price that we are prepared to pay. Could you rearticulate that for me? I may have this wrong, but 
in listening to everybody here, I thought I heard everyone agree to the proposition that at some point in looking at the totality of the Federal workforce, there are going to be some folks that are underpaid, some that are overpaid, and there are some that are paid just right. There may be differences about what the proportions are amongst the panel, but that general proposition is one that appears to have been accepted by everybody here. I think then the, the next question that has to be asked is how do we design a system that does a better job of actually ensuring that we are being as cost effective as possible to get the right talent, the best talent for government. And my proposition would be that that is the conversation we should be having, and um, I propose a set of principles that I hope can help uh, push that conversation forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And now you are back. Thank you, Mr. Travis. Uh, the Chair now recognizes the uh, uh, ranking member of the Oversight Committee, the distinguished gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Dr. Biggs, let, let me make sure I understand this uh, right. You are saying that, <clears throat> in answer to one of the Chairman's questions, you are saying that there is a great demand for these Federal jobs? Is that right? That is what research has indicated, yes. And so, and because there is a great demand, what does that have to do with pay? To, to remind us. A higher demand for Federal jobs does not prove that they are overpaid. It is, it is an indicator that individuals in the marketplace judge the package they are going to get from Federal employment, which includes salaries, benefits. Other, other, other characteristics of the work more attractive than they would find, uh, than they would find private sector work. You find similar indicators in things like quit rates for, for Federal employees. Those are consistently lower than the private sector. There could be other reasons for low quit rates, but that is indicative that, in general, it offers people a, an attractive uh, compensation package, yes. Well, most members of Congress uh, spend and collect millions of dollars to come here, and most could make a lot more money than what they are making. Apparently, there is something that members want that comes from this public service that we do. By the way, we are Federal employees, public servants. And I am just wondering, does that is that one of those other things that you just talked about that is the, the desire? I mean, when I talk to nurses, for example, and I talk to people who are in that kind of profession, they will tell you in a minute, in most instances, I love my job because I am able to help people. This is what I always wanted to be ever since I was a little boy, a little girl, and this is something that really means something to me. And, you know, you ask them, well, you know, do you, does it bother you to have to be cleaning up blood and all that kind of stuff? And they say no, because it's what they really, really want to do. When I talk to the people up here on the Hill, a lot of them will come, and I've seen this many times, and I'm sure everybody up here can tell you the similar stories. They want to come not so much for the pay. As a matter of fact, a lot of them are making a lot less pay. I, I, I literally just interviewed, just a few minutes ago, interviewed somebody who was willing to take a 15 percent cut because he wants to be a part of government, of helping people. So how much does that play? And, Ms. Kelly, I want you to be thinking about that, too. Uh, how much do you, I mean, is that part of that, 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 that little formula you, 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 you just gave us? No, I, wouldn't, I would not in any way deny uh, that, that a desire for public service and a desire to serve your country is an attraction for many people for serving the Federal Government. For myself, it has been when I served as congressional staffer. Oh, you, 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 you served, you, you were a public employee? Excuse me. <laughs> okay. I know it's very hard to believe. No, no, no. I just want to make you know you. I, I, it's it's I, sort of the, the desire to serve for public service is strong and is legitimate. The the question would be if what we had was simply a, a queue for federal jobs or low quit rates, that could be entirely attributable to a to a, a desire for public service. The results you find from pay studies, though, which control for education experience and the rest, and they find that the similar the same person would earn a higher salary on average in the Federal Government than the private sector, that is something which tends towards the view that there is overcompensation. One of the, the aspects of the study we did was not simply controlling for differences in education and so forth. We followed the same people over time using Census Bureau data. When those individuals switched from private sector employment to Federal employment, on average they got a pay increase. 
Not, that does not mean every person uh, gets a pay increase in the Federal Government. It does not mean that the, the highest, best qualified Federal employees couldn't earn more in the private sector. It does mean that, on average, the same person would earn a higher salary and much more generous benefits in the Federal Government than they would outside. Well, let me put it like now, you really just said something very interesting, because a lot of people are constantly trying to move forward, right? Hello. I assume that when you moved from public servant, mm -hmm. you apparently made, I guess, more money, did you? Well, I make less money now than I did. Oh, I, okay. Well, you're making my case. In other words, what you just said, I mean, usually if somebody's going to move from one job to another, in many instances they're going to move to to more pay. So if they're going to move from public to private, I mean, from private to to public and they are moving on a normal course, it is logical, I guess, that they are going to make more money. It is, but we controlled for that difference. Most people get a pay increase when they switch jobs. That is natural. Getting a pay increase is one of the main reasons why people do switch jobs. What we found was private sector workers who found a new job in the Federal Government receive pay around 8 percent higher than private sector workers who found a new job in the private sector. So you have the same person getting different jobs, and this has been replicated in other studies as well. So we are not simply saying, do you get a pay increase when you find a new job, because most people do. We are saying, do you get a larger pay increase if you find a new Federal job than if you find a new private sector job? And the answer to that is yes. I see my time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Cummings. Uh, now I recognize the distinguished gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Steer, is um, turnover in certain categories of job in the Federal Government a problem? Uh, yes, it is. And if I might just take two seconds, the name is Steyer. It looks like Steer, but parents decide pronunciation. So I, 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 I've heard it too Steyer. many times. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the answer is yes, absolutely. If you look at the overall attrition number relative to the overall private sector number, it is lower. But in the critical areas, new employees, first two years, it is actually about 25 percent. You heard already nursing, it is close to 18 percent. Uh, my favorite distressing example is the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, between 2003 and 2007, the first four years, uh, three quarters of the SES left. And what is amazing is no one was paying attention, no one did exit interviews to find out why. But the point is what we really ought to be looking at is not generic attrition, but attrition for the people we need to keep that are really vital. Exactly. So when we actually look at certain categories of employees, um, actually the attrition might be considerably higher than in the private sector, despite Absolutely. what we have heard. And your point, we have not bothered to find out why. Correct. Which most private sector firms I know do exit interviews. The, the good ones do. Yeah, the good ones do. Um, uh, Ms. Kelly, can you think of some other categories of Federal workers where turnover is high? Uh, the highest rate of turnover uh, for the past few years has been at TSA, those who protect our skies. The uh, turnover rate um, up until about a year ago was running at over 20 percent. A year? Yes. So these fat Federal salaries and cushy jobs and wonderful working conditions somehow don't prevent 20 percent of the workforce from leaving every year. Exactly. Hmm. And these TSA workers all earn less than $30,000 a year. There is no way they could be put into a category of overpaid anything. Mr. Steyer, um, a few years ago when we had a much lower unemployment rate, I mean, I am hearing testimony about how actually uh, a lot of people are flocking to, to Federal service or, or public service. Well, of course, when you have got an almost 10 percent unemployment rate, my guess would be historically that is a pattern. But when you are looking at, say, 4 percent unemployment rate, um, especially in the higher end skill sets, my guess would be that the labor market gets real tight in being able to recruit and retain skilled workers for the Federal workforce. Would that be true? Absolutely. And as you suggested, already, even with high unemployment, there are certain skill sets that the Federal Government is having a very hard time recruiting. For example? Well, the cybersecurity area is one that is obviously uh, front and center. Um, you have got examples with nursing. Wait, wait, let's stop with cybersecurity for a minute. Sure. I happen to represent a high-tech district. Why would that be a problem? Why, why are we having trouble recruiting people to work in the area of cybersecurity? Because there is a lot of competition. Ah. And it requires a high skill set. Absolutely. Technical skill set. Yes. 
Um, what percentage of the Federal workforce is eligible for retirement over this decade? Uh, you know, again, you are looking at, depending again on the, you are looking at over half. Over half. Right. Well, a very large uh, portion of the population will be eligible to retire. And again, I think the general numbers are less important than looking at the specific populations that we should be most concerned about. And there you see um, much higher numbers. So if I listen just to what I have heard from Mr. Shirk and Mr. Uh, Dr. Biggs, I would assume that, frankly, we are not going to have any trouble at all filling 50 percent of the existing Federal slots as people retire over this next decade. Is that your view as well, Mr. Starr? It is my view that there will be no problem filling the slots. The question is filling with whom, and are you getting the right talent? Well, no, of course, that is the question. And I think the answer is that we have to do a better job uh, in a lot of different respects if we really want to have the right talent in government. Ms. Kelly, do you have a view on that subject? I am very worried about the ability to um, fill the positions when they are vacated. And, you know, everyone, for years everyone talked about this tsunami that was coming of Federal retirement. And it didn't come in large part because of the economy. Um, but it will come. It will happen. And uh, agencies are not uh, positioned to be able to uh, hire at the skill level, the skill set, uh, to be able to maintain uh, what it is they are trying to do in their agencies today. And, and, of course, a final note, if I might be allowed an observation, the more we debase Federal service, the less attractive we make it, and we go to Mr. Steyer's point, then you have to worry about who you are attracting to Federal service, especially in the higher skill set. I thank the Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Connolly. I now recognize the uh, Vice Chair of this subcommittee, the distinguished gentleman from uh, Michigan, Mr. Amash, for five minutes. Mr. Shirk and uh, Dr. Biggs and, and uh, all of you, thank you for being here today. Mr. Shirk and Dr. Biggs, I have a, a question. How much would the Federal Government save if it equalized benefits with those provided in the private sector? I took a look at uh, both pay and benefits. I, I didn't take a look at uh, benefits specifically. If you would like that, I could uh, get it later. But uh, if you took uh, pay and benefits together, you would save about uh, $47 billion this year, under my accounting. I think that is about right, yeah. Thank you. Uh, another question. Um, excuse me for a second. Yeah. Uh, Ms. Ms. Kelly, your union represents a cross section of Federal workers who perform many key functions of government. Since the pay freeze was enacted, how many of your members have left Federal service? I couldn't give you an exact number. I can tell you that uh, many are talking about leaving, and many who uh, have been eligible to retire and were not going to and who plan to stay are now talking about leaving. I think that we will see real numbers uh, in the foreseeable future, but I, I could not give you a number today. I have a, a general question to any of you who can answer it. The, the President has talked about freezing pay for uh, two years. It, does this include uh, the within-grade step adjustments, which are 3 percent a year? No, it, it doesn't cover those at all. It's, it's purely the cost of living adjustment. But the, the vast majority of Federal employees are going to receive these uh, with the in grade adjustments, and we'll get those 3 percent raises. And the, uh, the, when Mr. Berry was here earlier, he testified that there should be no place in the Federal Government for nonperformers to hide. Uh, how would you respond to the fact that Federal Government rarely fires employees? In the, majority of, in the majority of cases, pay raises result from length of service rather than job performance. It is a, it's a pretty serious problem. Uh, once they pass their probationary year, which is the, the first year, within that first year it is about 20 percent of uh, Federal employees uh, either quit or, or are fired. But after that, it is very, very rare to see a Federal employee get fired. And there is also very few rewards for performing above and beyond just a, a mediocre level. Uh, federal managers rarely award performance ratings below three because it's it's a lengthy appeals process. The the employees have uh, it, it basically get to appeal and uh, and can challenge an adverse decision. Most managers simply don't want to go through the hassle. They want to manage the agency, not uh, not do that kind of work. So they almost always hand out a three or higher rating. The employees you know, they qualify for uh, the step increases. 
but very little uh, above and beyond that uh, is there in terms of performance pay. So it is simply designed to encourage mediocrity, but not going uh, above and beyond that, and very tough to get rid of the bad apples after the first year. And in my opinion, uh, showing an acceptable level of competence is not sufficient for, for raising a, a, a person's salary. Would you agree that uh, productivity, work ethic, dedication, performance, and exceeding expectations are the proper criteria for a salary increase? Sure. It's, uh, I, mean, I, I don't want to in any way demean the, the work ethic and the dedication of Federal employees. I have worked with them over significant periods of time, and as Director Barry said, you are very surprised at how hardworking people are. Um, at the same time, it does not serve the hardworking, dedicated Federal employees when, when the people who are not pulling their weight essentially cannot be fired. It is a natural process in any business that some people do very, very well and are promoted, others don't do very well and are fired. We, we, to explain the Federal uh, rates of firing, we, we would have to assume the Federal Government is extremely good at picking employees such that it never finds anybody who doesn't work out. It is it, just not plausible. It's a, you want to retain good employees. You want them to build up the job-specific skills that really do add to productivity, but you also want to have the flexibility to move on people who are not working out as well. And I think you need to find a strong balance between those two. Congressman, can I add to this, though? I think the things that you identified are important, but I also think that performance is important, and I think that performance is an aspect of the Federal system today. And the flaws that are being described um, and are being grossly overstated that Federal employees can never be fired because they are fired. Federal employees are fired after their probationary period. And if they are not fired at the rates that somebody thinks they shouldn't be, then someone needs to look at the implementation of the system within the agencies. And that means managers are not being trained on how to uh, deal with poor performers. They are not doing what they should be doing to either help them correct that performance or to move them out of the agency. That is the manager's job. Uh, that has nothing to do with the system. It is about the managers and it is about what the system um, supports from, for them from a training perspective as well as an implementation perspective. Thank you, Mr. Amash. Uh, that completes our questions. Uh, Mr. Lynch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I ask for unanimous consent to submit for the record the statements of the American Federation of Government Employees, the National Federation of Federal Employees, and the National Active and Retired Federal Employees. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, that completes our program. I want to thank our, our panel very much for being here. appreciate your patience, uh, and um, we stand adjourned. Thank you.